thank you again for the invitation. Um, I, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, it's been too long since I visited you in Michigan and uh, great to see you again, Henry. And uh, um, uh, I wish I could uh, say hi to all the other uh, colleagues and friends uh, at, at University of Michigan. Um, so I'm really honored to be um, discussing today the uh, mixed autonomy traffic work we're doing and specifically the Lagrangian or mobile control at uh, different scales. Um, and I'll try to um, um, find some commonalities with all the great work you're doing at uh, Michigan as well as M-City. Um, so this is joint work with the RISE Lab, Bayer, PATH, and Berkeley Deep Drive, and these are different consortiums or institutes or centers at Berkeley. So um, I usually like to start these types of uh, talks with uh, um, work that uh, Wadud, McKinsey, and Levy published uh, several years ago. Um, and, and I think th this paper that they published in 2016 was in a sense um, very interesting in opening the eye of many people working uh, with the Department of Energy on um, the potential externalities of uh, you know, automation of traffic and the fact that in a world where a lot of the cars become automated, um, the impacts of automation could be positive and negative, and that's what's represented on this graph. Um, this graph used to be something that the former um, uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy, Ruben Sarkar, showed a lot to motivate the work that he launched as part of SMART and, and that we were part of at the time. And, and it's really been inspirational for us uh, to, 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 uh, to keep as a focus. So, of course, in the domain of um, transportation modeling, um, as most of you know, there is a lot of different scales at which you can model the system and they're appropriate for different uses. So things like agent-based model can operate at very large scales. Um, things like micro simulations are also helpful at the scales of a city. Um, and when we started this work, and I would say uh, up to now, micro simulations um, were things that when I started my career as a student, you could use for maybe a few intersections. I think nowadays you could use it for corridors and beyond, and it could be that in a decade or so, you could use it for a full city, which is really promising and a motivation for the talk today. And of course, then you can go even deeper into the modeling below the hood, and that's not too much the, 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 the goal today. So that gives you a sense of kind of the frame at which uh, we, what we look at, and we mostly operate on that level, if you can see my mouse moving on the like a second to top level. Uh, and to be specific, and again, I'm making the assumption that most of the people in the audience know micro simulations, I mean, this is what a micro simulation looks like. So, um, you know, something that is able to model the trajectory of every vehicle down the road, uh, associate a vehicle class to it, potentially an energy model. Um, and then routing and, and, and all the features that you would want to model things at the scale of a few miles or a few dozens of miles. Um, there are three main leading um, products. There's more, but the, the ones we've been considering for this work uh, and the one we're mostly using, we started with MSON and we still work in MSON because we're a great partnership with Siemens. But most of what we do today is in Sumo because I think the, the open source is, is very appealing to us. So. <clears throat> One of the challenges that we see in the future with trying to use microSIM as an engine to do a lot of different controls um, <clears throat> is mostly the calibration of the models, the computation of the models, and the control on top of it. And if you think about microSIM in general, um, one of the things, <clears throat> I apologize, um, one of the things with microSIM is that as most of you know, it's really expensive to run a microsync for a time. So if you do a uh, algorithm that requires multiple iterations um, to produce a result, which is common in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning, well, the cost gets multiplied by the number of iterations and it very quickly becomes untractable. And that's kind of one of the motivation of our work is we're working on approaches that um, try to assemble microsim with reinforcement learning on the cloud in a way that we make some of it tractable. And we're, we're not there yet. This is really just the beginning, but it's already very promising. Um, so it's really a call to action in a sense of, if you're a Star Wars fan, I guess you'll recognize some of the characters here, but um, it's really a call to action in that um, I think this is the decade of mixed autonomy. Um, uh, and I think this is also the decade in which um, microSIM will become tractable. So there is a real chance that the convergence of AI, microSIM, and mixed autonomy will really advance the field of multiple vehicle coordination. And that's kind of the space in which we like to play here. Um, if we do a leap in the history, um, um, I'm sure some of you have seen this kind of interesting picture in Ohio of Bruce Greenshield measuring what turned out to be the first 
ever measurement of a traffic jam. And it was at uh, some kind of festival in the middle of Ohio in 1935. If you fast forward 20 years, that's when the first PD of traffic was explicitly written by um, uh, Lighty Wilhelm and Richards. There's two papers uh, in the mid 50s kind of using hyperbolic conservation laws to describe traffic, so micro models. And then if you forward another almost uh, half century, um, Fugiyama uh, did that experiment um, in uh, Japan in which he asked uh, drivers to drive in a circle and essentially maintain distances. And this video became really famous because this was also one of the first recorded um, in spectacular instantiations of string instability or stop and go or phantom jams. There's lots of different ways to characterize what's happening here. Essentially humans not able to maintain distances and leading to terrible traffic instabilities. Now, uh, or, over 10 years after that, um, one of our former students, Dan Work, with Benito Piccoli, uh, Benny Siebold, and John Sprinkle, reproduced that same experiment, but inserted a self-driving vehicle in that loop, which you see here with the arrow in black, except now it's just driven by a human, so you see these instabilities. And then when it turned out, it just did it now, the autopilot, so the automation manages to smooth the flow and you see the oscillations immediately uh, damped out. You can see it both in the movie, in the numbers, and in the red curve, which I'm hovering over here. Um, and it's quite spectacular because essentially one out of 22 vehicles is enough to smooth the flow. And if you read the energy consumptions from the OBD port, uh, you get 42% reduction in energy, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, so you can see a lot of, um, a lot of, um, um, progress made in almost a century between the first measurement of traffic jams and this uh, ability to control traffic. Now, one thing I'm going to show you now is the same thing in simulation that was done one year later. And this one was done by Kathy Wu, who is a, now a professor at MIT. She's an alum at Berkeley. And what she did is she managed to essentially um, uh, reproduce the same thing in simulation in Sumo, but this time the red car is automated. The blue car is the only thing the red car can see. And when the red car crosses that line that you see here, it will turn on the autopilot. And it just did. And as you can see, that now reproduced the same thing you just saw in the movie. And so if you're listening carefully now, you're probably wondering, why am I showing you a simulation in, that was achieved in 2018 when an experiment was achieved in 2017? It seems uh, you're walking backwards. There's a good reason for it. Um, and the reason is um, that if you think about what was done in 2017, it was mostly done by derivation of an explicit controller, the follower stopper, that relied on a lot of different articles that are model-based. Um, in fact, we counted the number of articles written between the first 1935 Bruce the Greenshield publication in 2008, and there's about 10,000 articles or more published on traffic modeling. And then once people started to really focus on string stability, there's probably at least 1,000 articles on string stability and related problems and stabilization. Um, and that essentially whole led to this experiment, which was spectacular. And the point that I'm making with that simulation that happened one year later is that that simulation and that stabilization did not require a model. And that's kind of a, it's kind of a pivot, I guess, in approach, because the way Kathy did that is essentially by training an RL policy on the outcome of a micro simulation, but the policy does not have a model of its own car, nor of the other cars. It just has access to a reward provided by the software. So you can view this as model-free deep RL. And that's pivotal because the performance is the same. So you could, you could kind of look at this and say, wow, there's like 80 years of people looking at models, 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 and I'm one of them. I, I published myself a lot of models. And then suddenly you can kind of redo the same uh, with no models. And so that was the start of us scratching our heads and figuring out, well, could we leverage that to do other things that maybe could not do with model? Or could we also just use models as a starter point for doing this? And this is kind of the rest of the talk today. So in most of the next slides you'll see in the next coming minutes, um, what you will see is usually a bunch of simulations uh, that show results. And the color coding of these is that every car in red is a CAV level two to level five, depending on the, the scenario. Every blue car is a car that can be sensed by the CAV. So usually the car in front, the car behind, 
Um, some case they'll all be blue. That means, okay, there's V2V everywhere. And a white car is a car that is just in the system, produces stuff, but nobody can sense it. It's just someone driving there. So the first thing we try to do is see, could we replicate what uh, was done in a single ring with two rings? Um, and the funny part is that what the car does in that circumstance is essentially, I don't know if you can see it over Zoom, but it's just switching lanes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, essentially preventing the cars behind from passing it and thereby stabilizing two rings. The cool part is that if you've ever worked on lane switch or lane change, you know it's really tough because there's a Boolean variable associated with uh, changing lanes. Usually it leads to NP hard problem. So it's very hard to do optimal control like this. Here, the algorithm just figured it out. And you could argue, well, that's not so impressive because you know even uh, police academy officers learn to do that. So the way I look at this is it's kind of an emergent behavior that the algorithm was able to pick. Um, and you know when we saw that, it was really encouraging because we thought we could do a lot more with that work. Uh, so we also looked at intersections. <coughs> and here's an interesting intersection case. So if no car is automated, um, what happens is essentially the politeness problem. Everybody stops at this stop sign and let everybody else go one at a time. And that's probably the most inefficient way of um, handling an intersection. If you train the algorithm um, with the same paradigm I've shown before, um, that's what it does. And if I try to narrate what's happening, essentially the red car figured out without knowing the models, the parameters of the IDMs of the blue cars and calculated the exact speed at which it would drive so that the intervehicular distance produces the perfect length of the snake to cover the intersection optimally. Now, of course, I'm just narrating that to you, but it's something that you can see happened in the learning. And that's quite phenomenal because maybe a human could do that, but the point is it doesn't need a model to figure this out. It just needs access to the simulation and you could argue well, it either rediscovered the IDM model or it rediscovered plate tuning in eight figures. There's lots of different ways to interpret that. But bottom line is it did something very sensible, sensible that a human would probably do, um, except it did not need a model of all the IDMs to do that. If I look at this scenario here now, um, you know, and I'm trying to maximize the efficiency of this intersection here. Um, it's not very clear what I should do here because there's two queues discharging with different length. Um, and so if I launch the exact same algorithm on that scenario, uh, what you will see it's doing is it's essentially stopping um, somewhat at frequencies that cannot really be explained, or at least I cannot explain, and at some point discharging cars um, at a frequency that it determines. So this is interesting because now it's the same algorithm, but it does something that I cannot even really in good faith uh, reverse engineer and explain. So it's figured out something I can't even fully comprehend. Um, and um, you can go on and on. So another thing you can do with this is um, you could do transfer learning where you learn something on the ring and then you apply it to a scenario it's never seen before, such as a merge and intersection. So I'm um, gonna skip this for now. The scenario is you have this merge and the merge essentially induces backward propagating shock waves, which you see now starting to form. I'm gonna inject another car and here we go. The wave gets a bit bigger, another car, and now the wave gets even bigger and maybe a last car. And now the wave is really propagating backwards. Okay, so this is how you can generate shock waves on these uh, little systems. Now, what happens if you add mixed autonomy um, you'll see once in a while there's a red car. The only thing it can sense is the blue cars. I keep injecting the cars in this kind of on-ramp. Uh, so right now there's not much uh, traffic waves. Now you can see the waves are forming. I'm gonna inject more. Now it's really clogged. Look at this car, it's just stopped right there. And then it starts again. So now it essentially has learned to be a traffic light. Like you have taught a self-driving vehicles to become a traffic light because it figures out that if it slows down, like it's just doing again, see that right there. It's essentially maximizing the throughput downstream because it anticipates that it will, if it was going to go faster, it would essentially catch up too soon. So you look at the time space diagram, uh, the left time space diagram here shows the trajectories. You can see these back propagating waves, okay? Um, and then you can see every time you inject a car, like here, here, if you see my mouse moving, um, essentially that's how the wave is generated. So I inject a new car, boom, wave. I inject a new car, boom, wave. Now, 
what it learned to do on the ring, it applies here. It figures out, oh, there is a new car injected and there's this wave propagating. I'm going to slow down and catch up right around the time I catch that merge point. Um, so again, an em a form of emergent behavior I can explain, but it's really nice because it actually learned to do that in the ring and figured out it should apply that to the merge. Um, so this was one of the first instantiation of, of the work that two of my PhD students did, uh, Ab um, Abu Dikwerdie and Eugene Vinitsky. Um, and essentially, they started to do penetration studies of, you know, the question is, um, how many cars would you need to smooth traffic uh, and how much energy savings would you produce with that percentage of cars? So these were the first penetration studies we run. Obviously, very idealized case, um, um, simple merge scenarios, but it was very interesting and um, it did catch some attention initially. It was even picked up by, by Science Magazine. Um, uh, so we're pretty excited at the time. Now, what we're doing today is we are trying to see if <coughs> the same things I just described here could be applied to stop and go waves. Um, so stop and go waves known as jamitons, uh, phantom jams, etc., cetera, um, are essentially waves that happen like you see here for no good reason. It's just the same human inability to self-regulate that leads to these instabilities. So technically the demand is not high enough to fully clog the freeway, yet it reaches past jam density uh, in geospatially varying locations that depend on the instability. So the idea is, could you use that to smooth these waves? Uh, so when we do that, um, now we look at real scenarios. And so typically um, the models that we use for this are uh, micro simulations um, that are generated by the connected corridors teams in, in, in California. So these are working for district seven. So these are fairly you know, sophisticated uh, micro simulation uh, runs um, that also includes arterials. We mostly apply it for the freeways. Um, that we used for the training of our model. So the same thing that I just showed you in Sumo, that's, this one is in uh, Imsan, but we're gonna use now to train our model uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, uh, in software. More specifically, um, what you see here is essentially the, the wave. So I'm gonna just pause and explain. This is a zoom of the previous, this one is on Sumo, the traffic goes um, eastbound. Um, initially, it has white cars, so just like uh, IDMs. Um, it has a few red cars, but they're not on. They just behave like humans. And uh, initially, you're going to see these waves happening in that, uh, in that calibrated model. Ultimately, some cars will turn in blue. That means now we turn on the autopilot, and that will hopefully smooth the waves. So that's what you should do. I know that's not great to see over Zoom because it's a little bit complicated um, uh, to show movies uh, at the high frequency over Zoom, but hopefully you'll see that. So right now you see that big wave um, um, uh, forming here. It's getting into the box right there. So you can see now up, it's in the box. And now you have these waves that's going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, you might not be able to see this uh, through the Zoom, but I tell you it's go back and forth and back and forth. And there's no controller. In about 10 seconds, um, you're gonna see the controller being turned on. Um, when that happens, there's blue cars that or cars that will be turned in blue. These are the cars that can be sensed by the automated vehicles, and it will try to flush the oscillation. So right now, everything is clogged. There's these waves that are back and forth and back and forth. Um, and uh, now you see the blue cars. So that means now the controller has been turned on, and it's starting to smooth things. So you, you might be able to see it through your screen. The flows are getting smoother. The waves are being damped. And uh, even though we're slightly above critical density now, there's no more um, oscillations. And the more I let it play, the more you'll see it flushes things. And that's the aspiration we have here with these, uh, with, with these uh, algorithms. So essentially, we're trying to smooth things. Um, we're not looking at improving travel time. And we're not looking at changing VMT either. The idea is you work with fixed VMT, nearly fixed travel time, but you smooth traffic. So you prevent the stop and go while maintaining the throughput. Uh, that's kind of the um, illustration of what I just showed you. So essentially without the control policies you have, so this is a four lane freeways, you have all the um, uh, shock waves that happened uh, with the real, uh, the RL control policy. I mean, you still have congestion because that's not going to change. But you you notice that this is more on the yellow side, and there's no stripes of red, which means essentially you've managed to smooth the um, the waves. Um, and so the question is, when you do that, how do you do that? And you have to be careful because um, uh, so the idea is you would like to reward 
uh, the energy consumed and say, well, the more energy you save, um, well, the better you do. But there's a very trivial solution, which is, okay, stop all the vehicles, and then you get a zero energy, and that's optimal. And that's true. But of course, that's not what you want to do. So when you start to shape a reward for an RL algorithm, there's a lot of work to be done in understanding how you're also going to integrate the constraints. Like, for example, um, how do you maintain the constant throughput? Or how do you uh, make sure the vehicles don't stop? Um, and so in order to make these algorithms work, in fact, there's a lot of kind of experimental algorithmic design that is needed. There's not much theory, but it's just more how do you devise a reward function that will not produce some kind of stupid behavior where to achieve optimality, you stop all the vehicles. Um, things we're looking at now is could we apply this to bridges and merges? So this was an old run that we've now improved with Baybridge where um, you can try to prevent the clogging of a downstream bottleneck uh, by essentially preventively holding vehicles. And there's a lot of questions on, you know, do you do this centralized, decentralized? Um, do you have access to all the information, partially information? And we're just writing a paper on this. We'll, we'll publish it in the next couple of weeks and um, uh, it will have all of the results that, that, that show the performance of the algorithms in the different circumstances and, and, and with the different assumptions of architectures to sense and actuate. Um, obviously, we'd like one day for this to replace the bridge metering, uh, but yes, that's not happening tomorrow. Um, but that's kind of where it's heading is the idea is that, you know, a meter on a bridge like Bay Bridge um, is a single actuation point for um, up to 10,000 vehicle per hour, five lanes uh, included. Um, what if you could manage this in a lot more efficient manner if you had a distributed actuation? And okay, again, this is not happening tomorrow, but I, that is more aspirational. We also worked uh, with a um, person you probably all know very well, um, uh, Andreas Manikopoulos at the University of Delaware, former Michigan, um, also very uh, active at NCity. Um, and there we tried to do transfer learning where I'm going to replay that movie so you can see it better. Um, so the idea is that you have this roundabout. It's at uh, Mini City uh, that they built uh, at uh, UW, at U University of Delaware. Um, and so there is cars coming in this way and that way, and you try to maximize the throughput of the roundabout. So the idea is you want to minimize the final exit time of the last vehicle. On the left is with no control policy. On the right is with control policy. The blue cars are the automated vehicles and the other cars are the humanly driven vehicles. And if you focus on the Hummer vehicle, this one on the left and this one on the right, it will be the last vehicle on the right. And notice the last exit time of that vehicle on the right movie happens way before on the left movie. Right now I can see the Hummer is almost exited. It's done, but there's still other two cars on the other one. So this is typical ways of um, users of this to uh, now try to improve other metrics. In the previous cases, I said, we work with constant VMT or nearly constant travel time. Here's difference, like minimizing the flush time. Um, we also showed that at a CPS um, uh, meeting. Uh, this is Eugene Vinitsky, one of the students, and uh, Feng Yu Wu, who is implementing this on these vehicles. Um, and, and so we also have a lot of uh, hardware work that we do there. Now, I want to um, switch gears a tiny bit and push this even one step further. So if you think about the way we're using deep reinforcement learning, essentially we're using a very classical thing. We've not invented anything. We're just users at this point. And what our algorithms do essentially is um, they take the environment. The environment is essentially, you name it, Sumo, Emson, whatever expert-based simulation environment. It spits a reward, VMT, TTT, energy, you name it. And it spits a state. It tells us, oh, and by the way, this is the state of every vehicle, where state means position, speed, history, and anything you want. Based on that, the RL algorithm computes the next best move um, to um, optimize the system, and that's the action space that spits back into the environment. And this is the way, essentially, all the algorithms I've shown before have worked from the very beginning, the, 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 the one that Kathy Wu put back in the days, to smooth the ring to all the way to the bottleneck and the 210. Now, there's a fundamental assumption here. And the assumption is that you compute your optimal control or your action based on knowledge of the reward, RT, and the state. Now, I'm going to ask a provocative question. What if you did not have access to the state, but just a rendering of the state? So you cannot measure speed, acceleration, position. You just have a picture of it. So the idea is, let's just assume that we're looking at this, 
we can see what's happening, but we cannot really measure it other than seeing pictures. So say you see the last five time steps of first a simulation. So that's mini city again of Marikopoulos. If you were hovering over the city and that's just, if you're local vehicle, well, you kind of see what's happening around you. And the fundamental question is, could you redo what I showed you up to now, but bypass this access to the state? No more OBD access, no more um, V2X or V2I or V2 something to measure things, just cameras or rendering. Um, and the truth is you can do it by measuring, by somewhat changing the reward function. Um, and um, what uh, we demonstrated is that if you do that, you do not degrade the performance that much in some cases. So this is what would happen if you on the left measured things by just looking at rendering. So look, I see moving stuff. Um, so essentially I see pixels, but I, don't, I can't measure speed or anything. It's just pixels. And based on pixels, I try to do better at that reward function. So we, we showed that that already worked with the ring and with the eight figure, and we have um, hope that it would work for other things as well. Um, so the beauty of that is that you can do this in a centralized fashion, like on the left, or in a decentralized fashion, like on the right. So centralized fashion would be to say, I'm gonna train my deep reinforcement learning algorithms um, to just look at all the pixels of the entire mini city. And the decentralized fashion would be to say, well, I can only measure locally. So, okay, if what you see in every circle here is essentially um, what every vehicle is seeing around it. Um, and then maybe there is some information exchange, but bottom line is you can only see, th see things locally. And we've also tried to do that and it does provide some actually good results as well. So the reason why that's important is that if you think about the future of mixed autonomy, um, we already have good confidence that we can do it like on the left. Like you look at the fully centralized movie like you see on the left and um, it's already a good tool to do optimization. Then um, it's much more challenging to do in a decentralized fashion like in the middle, but it can be done. And so, you know, where is that going in terms of technology? Well, this movie that I'm showing on the right, it's something that, you know, it, you can have on your car tomorrow by buying a dash cam and then just sending there's many companies that essentially provide you segmentation capabilities to measure things around you. And then if you take, of course, you know, high end vehicles like the Teslas or others, you have like up to six cameras, uh, uh, front facing, back facing, side facing. So um, in the next 10 years, every new vehicle that has some decent level of automation will have the capabilities to measure what I'm showing in the right movie which I look at as a set of pixels, period. So in a sense, you could say that what's in the middle movie is just a reduced version of what's in the right movie. And 10 years from now, every car will have it. And so that's why I think there's a huge opportunity looking in the future into understanding the types of models that could be built that are neural net based, but not necessarily phenomenological model based. So, you know, in the last century, we've built um, the um, car following models, the intelligent driver model, the Bando model, the follower stopper model. There's like a, a huge library of models that somehow characterize specific characteristics of the human and the interaction of the human and its surrounding. But what if in the future, all you needed is to build neural net models from, from pixels of what you see and use this to control things. And that's one thing which personally excites me because I do believe that it has the ability to bypass a lot of the model-based analysis we do, and maybe in some cases to even uh, benefit from that analysis. And so it's kind of a, you know, if you look at the history of, of the field, um, there's kind of this gruesome picture here, kind of a fun once on the blog. Um, essentially, Google kind of killed um, Pong um, several years ago with that approach. What you see on the left is a movie that I'm sure you've seen on YouTube many times. Um, and what it does is essentially trains an algorithm to play Pong, um, but just by looking at the pixels. So when I was six years old, this was one of the most famous games in, in that Atari had put forward. And if you are too young to know what this is, essentially you, start, you try to break the bricks by just uh, moving your thing so the ball doesn't uh, fall behind you. Um, now, this is what a six years old person thinks of what this is. Um, but to a computer watching this, it's just pixels and a score. And essentially with Q learning, Google was able to train the software to win at that game without even understanding what the notion of a ball is or breaking breaks, but by just looking at pixels and computing a reward 
based on the behavior of the agent um, and what it had recorded as the pixels. And what you'll see is that with that learning, it's actually doing quite well because after some time it becomes so smart that it's able to do what I used to do as a six years old boy. Essentially you dig a hole, you get the ball to go behind and breaks all the bricks without you doing any work, which it did figure out um, in, in my six year old boy um, uh, approach. It was like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking a wall and putting a ball behind it like it's doing right now. You see it on the left. Um, but to a computer, it's just, okay, it's something that gets really high reward. Um, and so let's see, it's going to happen now. Yeah, see, it's doing it right now. So, um, so you could argue that, you know, these simple things have been killed by pixel learning. Um, of course, there was AlphaGo, which was really brilliant because when uh, computers started to beat the world champion, um, it used very, very um, unintuitive uh, approaches to, uh, to do it. That's what you see on the, on, the, on, on, on the right. So aspirationally, one could hope that, uh, you know, this problem, which I'm showing here, uh, can partially be solved locally by AI as well. Obviously, in transportation, we understand there's demand and, and you can change demand, that's one thing. But once demand is realized, can you change the efficiency on the freeway to make it uh, the most efficient it can be? And so I think that's where uh, there's a lot of uh, potential with deep reinforcement learning. And I think we're just scratching the surface here, but what we're seeing in this model-free approach is very, very uh, promising. Um, so if you go to our website, you'll see we, we have a, a open source software um, that we've made available to the public for this. Um, essentially what it does is it uh, interfaces um, deep reinforcement learning libraries um, with um, uh, essentially two micro simulator tools we have, Sumo and Imsun, and it all runs on AWS or your favorite cloud, doesn't matter. Um, I, I think when we did it, it was probably one of the few, if not the first um, uh, framework to do it. In fact, Imsun, um, if Imsun did have its first cloud compatible implementation of Imsun uh, for us, it was for the connected corridors. Uh, so at the time it was really new and then Sumo obviously was a lot more um, amenable to, to that because of the way it was built. Um, I think now it's pretty much, um, uh, you know, kind of a state of the art, but, um, but I think um, uh, we'd still make that available. So if you're interested in playing with this, there's a few um, startup cases and, and papers that explain how to do it. Um, so you, you, if you're interested in using that software, you can do it. I mean, it's kind of Lego blocks, bring in your uh, Sumo network um, and then train it and then, and then uh, build on it based on, based on what you have. Um, one of the aspirations we had was to also create a dashboard. We turn it off now, but we're going to turn it off again, uh, turn it on again later. So for those of you who do robotics, you probably are familiar with Mujoko, which is what you see on the left, on the right. So Mujoko is this kind of... Um, uh, World Olympics, if you will, of robotics uh, for uh, any basic, uh, you know, system you can think of. So like a exoskeleton or spider or ant or like there's a bunch of benchmark problems. And essentially, um, the beauty of it is that when you check in your algorithm, you can benchmark yourself against the rest of the community because these are become benchmarks. So the idea is we're going to do something similar with energy for traffic. Um, and that's something we initially published at Coral. Um, what we're building now for the U.S. Department of Energy is essentially a, a whole pipeline where uh, we have a leaderboard. It's not accessible to the public, but we hopefully will have it live in a few months. Um, so if you're interested, we're very happy to, to work with you. So the idea is, again, you have calibrated models of specific freeways, and you can check in algorithms and compare them against each other. And so that's what that dashboard looks like if you um, look at it from the inside. Um, so on the, on the horizontal axis is the date. And then on the vertical axis is the score, and you can see algorithms improving over time. And every time you check in an algorithm, it will show you a bunch of things on how it's doing on that particular scenario. Uh, we also have done some workshops and, and uh, are once in a while doing tutorials. So if you're interested, we can uh, uh, train you. Um, and I also I just want to showcase the team here. Uh, it's not just Berkeley. I mean, it's a, it's a fairly large team. There's about 50 people now. Um, so the headquarters are at Berkeley, but the test beds are in Vanderbilt. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and we work very closely with the Toyota, uh, GM and Nissan now. So, um, and the Tennessee Department of Transportation. So it's, it's a multi, um, faceted team, which includes anything from, uh, AI to, uh, essentially hardware development. Um, so for example, at the University of Arizona, John Sprinkle, who's also in the program, um, has developed a Leap Panda based a Coma AI implementation pathline that takes our policies and essentially migrates them to ROS so we can uh, experiment with them directly. Um, and that's kind of uh, the way it looks like. So, for example, he has um, 
uh, oops, sorry for that. Uh, um, so he has um, uh, a way to already remote drive the car. And this summer in Nashville, Tennessee, will be able to um, to uh, to experiment it in the uh, in the in, in in the field. And this is the test bed that Dan Work is now developing with the TDOT, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, and that's going to be really our test bed. Um, and so there, what you see is a, a instrumented uh, set of the freeway. They're deploying one pole like the ones you see here. Um, every uh, 500 meters. So this is the first three poles um, when they deployed them. And then I think there's a $12 million investment from the Tennessee Department of Transportation to instrument the rest of the I-24 freeway. Um, and so Vanderbilt is very actively involved in erecting these poles. You can see the first pole being erected right now as I speak. Um, and essentially each of these poles has a six pack video camera um, uh, system that will give us very high fidelity recordings of all the things I'm showing. So you can see with this pixel learning business I showed earlier, I think there is a lot of um, hope that uh, one day one could use that also um, to operate that freeway. And this is the three first poll of that project that I'm showing here. Um, if you're interested in uh, downloading the software, uh, go to this URL flow-project.github.io um, it's all open source, uh, so you should be able to download it uh, easily. Um, and then, of course, if you're interested about the Circles project um, as a consortium, or if you're an automaker or an industry startup, or even have interest, period, as an academic, um, go and contact us. Uh, we are on five campuses already, and we plan to grow that community even further uh, in the future. And with this, um, I think I've reached the end of my presentation, so I'm going to stop sharing, um, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Alex, and, and I really enjoyed your your talk. And it's good to know uh, how uh, you know how much work you have done in this in, in this uh, field. I have been following this work as well. And I just talked to Dan a couple of weeks ago together with Tina CDOT people as well, because we are about to start our smart intersection project, and which involve a, a number of uh, instrumentation and then uh, traffic flow control as well. Uh, so, so I'm going to ask, uh, there's actually some questions already from the, the audience, and I'm going to ask audience to type in the questions in the in the chat box, and then I'm going to ask from uh, those questions from the chat, chat box. I see some of the questions already. But before I ask the question from the audience, let me ask the question for myself. <laughs> so one of the things, um, as I mentioned, that we're going to start the Smart Intersection Project, and uh, which mostly on urban arterials and uh, intersections. And, and, and um, so you show the result on some of the controls, uh, flow controls, particularly on the meterings and as well as, uh, you know, freeways and, and uh, utilizing the vehicle itself as a sort of a regulator of the traffic flow so that uh, you can reduce these congestions. And do you think these, uh, how these will, um, will uh, work in, uh, you know, urban intersection or urban material um, scenarios? And, and uh, can this be, uh, combine together or integrate together with uh, intersections, with traffic signals, because uh, signal is going to be there for, you know, for still going to be there for some years, right? So, um, so what, what, where, uh, what's your comments on those? Um, so this is interesting, and thank you uh, for, for the for the question, and 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 thank you for for the comments too. Um, you know, I think that the main difficulty with intersections is. Um, V2X, where X can include I and V. Um, and I think that unfortunately, um, there is a bit of a chicken and egg problem that we have a hard time to solve, um, I, I, I feel. Um, so down the road, uh, I think if you look at the instrumentation of vehicles, I think that um, uh, intervehicle communication and sensing will enable it. I have, I have a very hard time to say when. I mean, Steve Schladover predicts 2075, um, so that's many decades from now. Um, and, you know, he's very knowledgeable. And so I, I couldn't predict anything in, in, in that fashion. But maybe the one moonshot statement I can make is the following. Um, in the Generation 1 automated highway system, the way they made it work in the mid-90s is by instrumenting the freeway. And then, of course, that's why it didn't work that way because it was too expensive at the time to do it over the whole of the US. Um, and now we see with the, I guess, generation two self-driving vehicles, how most of the players are also struggling. I mean, you've seen what happened at Lyft, at, uh, at ATG and Uber, it's actually not that easy. Um, 
So I think there is an opportunity to rethink again. Um, and now I look at cities in the Middle East, like Dubai, Neom, uh, maybe Abu Dhabi. I think cities like this might have an opportunity for instrumentation of the infrastructure to the point where you could support such a vision. And I'm saying this mostly because the urbanization and land use and development there is not only going at a pace that is much faster than here because they're developing the cities, but also because of the nature of the investment. And so if I had to venture a guess, I would say that the first time we're gonna see a reality like you're describing will probably be in that region of the world because they have an opportunity to redesign from scratch as opposed to us in the West have cities, which like my hometown in Paris has been there for 2000 years. Um, and probably the traffic lights have been there for over half a century. And they probably don't even have a 2070 controller from Siemens or any other companies because, well, that's just not the way they build it. Um, and therefore um, it's very hard to do incremental upgrade to get to that vision. And so if I had to venture a guess, I would say that this vision that you're outlining, Henry, which I think is really the vision of the future, um, will work best uh, and emanate from places which have an opportunity to do design from scratch. Um, and that's, I think, the way the chicken and egg problem will be broken. And once it's broken, then I think it's just a matter of adoption. Um, so maybe you can invite me again in 15 years and we'll, we'll, we'll see if, 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 if my guess was correct or, <laughs> or if it was completely off. Hopefully not in 15 years, and and, and uh, once we we're gonna start in, install some of our equipment uh, next year and see we can um, well at least from the test bed perspective we'll, we'll see some of these uh, uh, possibilities whether we can accelerate these uh, these uh, uh, and, and and you know Henry one thing I'm I'm thinking also is that maybe um, maybe the way to crack that egg is. Um, the, if you take the classical um, transit vehicle actuation problem, which uh, you know Germans figured out decades ago for the Straßenbahn, the, the trolley, and 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 we start to adapt, maybe that's the way to get there. Like the, all the beautiful work you're doing at MCD on the instrumentation and and all that stuff, um, maybe the way to make sure that we don't have to bring in all the auto manufacturers because it's too complicated to integrate is like. What about the transit buses first? What about these vehicles first? Because they're a dedicated fleet, it's a, a fixed route, um, it's known in advance, so it's much easier. And maybe that's the way to crack it, like have it become state of the art for transit first, and then hopefully by then the auto world will have caught up. Yep, yep, yep. That's actually one of our uh, implementation applications uh, on uh, transit signal priority as well as uh, in, uh, 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 signal preemptions for uh, emergency vehicles. And so I'm going to uh, move on to questions from the audience. And this is a question from our mutual friend, <laughs> Michael Zhang. <laughs> so he has two questions. And I think these questions are interesting. And one of the questions he's asking that uh, when you do the training, how the, you know, the underlying model really help you, um, you know, for the training, um, 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 you know, uh, in your tri trial and error process. And, uh, and there's a recent trend on the physics informed, uh, you know, um, machine learning and how this will, can this help you with your training? Yes, yes, yes. And, and I know I was a little bit provocative in the way I kind of uh, maybe discarded all the models a bit too fast. Um, so absolutely. I think that, um, uh, I mean, it's interesting, right? There's different ways you could train you could train a policy from scratch, um, assuming the policy is not even designed as a control as a um, car controller, um, which is one of the approaches we have chosen. The danger of that, of course, is that it might do really crazy things. I'll tell you one in a minute, um, because it's not meant as a controller. Another way to benefit from this whole legacy of, 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 of thousands of papers, um, including our own, um, is to say, why don't we just train the functional class of controllers? So say, we're gonna have follower stopper uh, with maybe five design parameters, and we're gonna train within that class, or even selecting amongst multiple classes, uh, IDMs and bandos and follower stoppers and mm -hmm. you name it. Um, and then it becomes physics inspired. And so actually we've done that too. One of my students, Abudi Kraidier, is using imitation learning to learn the follower stopper algorithm without making the assumption you know the parameters. So if you've looked into the work of Dan Work and John Sprinkle, you'll notice a 2017 paper called Follower Stopper. Mm -hmm. In that paper, there is a desired speed target 
that is used by the algorithm to smooth the traffic. And most of the users of that algorithm make the assumption you know that speed or you prescribe that speed. Uh, and of course, um, that makes the algorithm work way better. But in practice, if you operate at a place where you don't have measurements, I mean, it's kind of a, an assumption that you cannot really use. Um, so here's a good example of how you can train a policy to imitate a follower stopper, so physics inspired, um, without knowledge of the target speed. Uh, and, and that works really well. And so we're gonna, I don't think the paper is out there, but um, uh, yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to broadcast it when we publish it, but Abudi Kraidye is gonna publish this in a few, um, in a few, uh, in a few uh, weeks or months. So yeah, I think that's, that's really valid. And, and maybe the final way to uh, uh, answer that question is that um, we can be radical on one axis and do just uh, pure neural net based zero physics. Um, sometimes it works better, but sometimes it's very dangerous. Or you could do the other axis, which is like, okay, just ma manual design explicit. And then I think mixing the two with imitation learning, warm search or stuff like this would be really great. One last thing about interpretability. You know, one of the issues that people mention is like, okay, you train this neural net and well, you've no idea what you're getting. And it's true. I mean, we've trained neural nets to imitate follower stopper and they go, go full speed until they catch the next vehicle and then mm -hmm. break us because breaking costs nothing. Um, and that's very not physical. So I, I think we have to be careful when we train things uh, uh, in complete vacuum of, of the physics, because the, the physics is an important thing. Sure, sure, sure. The next uh, question is also an interesting question, and uh, it's mentioning in the simulation you have certain car following behaviors, and uh, what happens uh, when uh, real human driver trying to game the AV actuators? Um, so we have not tried it on the real road with real people yet, <laughs> so <laughs> we cannot answer that question at this time. Um, um, and but so what we see in simulation is that yeah if you if you smooth too much the, you leave the gap too much between vehicles so vehicle will typically go in and that's easy to simulate in fact in sumo because there is a functionality in sumo where if there's more than x seconds gap uh, it will automatically merge in in fact Carl Hedrick one of the legends of this world used to say one second people won't merge two seconds people who are aggressive will merge three seconds people will merge so that's kind of the rule of thumb of the old ahs system um so yeah that is a problem and i think um it's going to be interesting because it's, imagine fast forward 10 or 15 years from now when um, every vehicle on the road has a cruise control system that can enable that i mean Tesla can do it today, and there's a few other brands that already can do it by just a software push. So fast forward 10 or 15 years from now, when um, it has become a technological reality, um, if few vehicles participate at a given time, it's likely that people will game the system, or there will be road rage, because why is that person driving so slowly? But it's also likely that if the penetration rate is high enough, then it locks in the system, and it's almost like shepherding it. Um, Nevertheless, there is real questions about social acceptance. Uh, road rage is one problem. And I think that maybe the historical analogy is, you know, when they invented traffic lights um, 80 years ago, probably at some point, some person came out to an intersection with something that told them to stop when the intersections were empty. And well, nowadays it's become part of the social norms. There's a traffic light, it's red, you stop. So I think there will be a similar learning phase here. Um, essentially human, beings trying to, well, learning to live in mixed autonomy. That's a good point as well. There's a, this is actually related, there's a related question um, um, uh, related uh, with the application. Um, so this is, the question is, this seems very intriguing in theory, but how can we uh, actually apply this to the real life, especially when you mentioned the CVA knows somehow a uh, smooth traffic flow like the, um, that, 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 that like the circular with, without actual V2X and V2A connections, since uh, um, we are mostly talking about smoothing human, you know, tra vehicular traffic flow. Um, well, okay, so there's multiple layers in the question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, the first layer is, uh, if we want this to go to the field quickly, we cannot make the assumption that there is um, I to V that is rapid. The best you could do is maybe there is a, um, maybe there's something that feeds information like Google Maps. So you have a vague idea of speeds at a very crappy level, every 500 meters, there's a different reading. Um, and I think that's the most you can assume if you want this to work at scale. 
Um, because otherwise that means you have to have special communication networks or you have to really go high volume on um, the 5G network or, and that's just not realistic. So let's make that assumption. If you make the assumption, all you have is essentially crappy traffic information at bad granularity. The game is, can you train a policy that is fully decentralized and still improve things? In other words, something that only uses local measurements, mm -hmm. any historical data you want, because maybe there is historical data and still operates well. Um, I think there's still potential improvements that can be done there. We have some results that show that. But of course, it's as usual, right? It's, it's going to be way worse than if you have fully centralized and fully connected. So um, I still think that this is uh, something that is worth pursuing. Um, and the reason is, you know, go to the 280 freeway in California. The speed limit is 65, but people drive 75 turn on your Tesla's autopilot and try to look at what the autopilot will pick up as a speed. I'm not gonna give you the answer, just try to do it. Um, and you can see that in fact, that question is already being solved by some manufacturers because you have to. What if the social speed is actually higher than the speed limit? How will the cruise control or whatever autopilot you wanna call it, select its final speed? So in a sense, that's the short-term um, implementation of what I'm describing here. It's, that choice has to be done anyway. Um, it's just today it's based on specific criteria, safety and on speed limits, legality, but in the future it could be done on other choices. And then maybe down the road, five years, 10 years down when communications get um, more uh, ubiquitous, then I think there's opportunities for different types of coordination that lead to increased efficiency. Excellent, excellent. Um, Alex, we have one minute left over, but I, I, I saw an interesting question here, um, sort of uh, uh, asking you um, what is exactly is Liao Chao Professor of Engineering, what Liao Chao means? <laughs> um, so there's two Berkeley alums, Liao and Cho, uh, who okay. once upon a time were very successful in the semiconductor uh, industry and very generously donated um, um, funds to establish this chair at Berkeley. And we're really grateful to their generosity. Um, I've met them on several occasions. Um, uh, they, they're very um, strong supporters of our campus. And, uh, and uh, uh, it's thank you for bringing this up. Uh, it's really um, an, an honor for me to be um, the courier of this chair. They, they, they're good people, good friends. Uh, good alums and, and then I, I can't resist now that you uh, said this to say go bears. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>